We are celebrating the month of Ramadan, a month of change, great change. And indeed, change begins within us. So the month of Ramadan is not only a month where we abstain from eating or drinking throughout the period of the fast, but it's a period where our eyes also observe the fast. So we do not observe that which God is not pleased with. And we make sure we entertain our eyes with that which seeks the pleasure and the satisfaction of God. Furthermore, our ears also fast. So we do not engage in hearing that which displeases God. And we make sure that we entertain our ears with that which seeks the pleasure and the satisfaction of God and it brings us closer to Him. And I do not mean that we dedicate the entire period to supplications and prayer. So that we're sitting, for example, in the local mosque or in our, for example, bedrooms and hearing the Holy Quran play or supplications or different types of prayer. What I mean by dedicating our ears and our eyes and our entire existence to God is to be able to conquer the highest mountains of human perfection through moral and ethical standards. To do that which is moral, to act with the utmost levels of ethical principles. But change does not stop there. Change in the month of Ramadan continues And I recall that the Prophet Jesus, the son of Mary, peace be upon him, says that the prophets before me warned you not to commit adultery, and I tell you not to think of adultery. So the month of Ramadan brings such a change within our lives. We do not think of sin. We do not contemplate on sin. We do not dedicate our mind and our soul to that which takes us away from God. And by that I also mean we don't sit there and contemplate on God's existence or the Prophet or his family throughout the whole day. But we contemplate on things that bring us closer to God. One of those things is to remind ourselves with the impoverished, with those who do not have clean water to drink while we're thirsty in the month of Ramadan with those suffering from hunger and starvation throughout the world. How can we change that? How can we change their lives? We experience 17 hours of fast, 17 and a half hours of fast. I tried to sleep for the most part, but... <laughs> and it's, it's tiring. It's tiring and you feel weak, especially when the body's dehydrated and you need water. But this continues for us for 29 or 30 days, and that's it, it's, it's over. But for some people, especially in some impoverished parts of the world, that's every day of their lives. Every day they don't have drink, clean water to drink. Every day of their lives they don't have food to eat. I remember I went to one of the countries, impoverished country, and I was taken on a tour to visit some people. We went into, I mean, it's not a home, it's, it's a small building, it's bricks on top of another, it doesn't even have a roof. It also was missing, for example, a bathroom inside the, so, they, so when they opened the door, there were six children that were living in that particular home. Six children. The eldest was eight years old. Eight years old. None of them had shoes, none of them had food, and it was very cold and none of them had blankets, they were shivering. And this trip was where we were observing them, we were observing how they lived so that we can bring aid. And when I was leaving, their mother held me, she literally held me, she was crying. She said, we don't need anything, we just want bread. Just send us some bread. My kids do not have anything to fill their stomachs with. So the month of Ramadan is that month where stop, the change does not stop. It continues where we dedicate our minds.
for several hours a day to think how is it that I personally, even if you're 17 or 18 years old, don't tell me a 17 or 18 year old cannot bring such change. I know an 18 year old that raised a million dollars for the orphans of Iraq. I know a 19 year old that raised $700,000 for the orphans of Afghanistan. So it's when we sit and we contemplate on what is it that we are required to do today in the 21st century to bring ourselves closer to God. And change begins within us and then it takes part within our community. And our community is in dire need of change. What do I mean? Several years ago, Pew and Gallup those two very famous research centers, they released some shocking numbers and polls in regards to the religion of Islam in North America. Amongst them was that 39% of Americans would feel nervous if they had a Muslim neighbor. 34% of Americans would feel nervous if they were on the same flight as a Muslim man. 18% of Americans would feel nervous if they boarded the same flight with a Muslim woman. 51% of Americans opposed the building of a mosque near ground zero. Why? Those changes, those numbers and polls are extremely alarming and disturbing. And they need to be changed, and they need to be changed immediately. And by that I mean we should not rest, we should not settle, we should not sleep until we change the minds of the average Joe when it comes to Islam, that Islam is not a religion of terror. Those individuals that you find on the news are not Muslim. They have nothing to do with Islam and Islam has nothing to do with them. Those are simple things. We have to get them across, but we're not loud enough. For uh, an average person, we believe sometimes that, look, I don't need to really go and tell people that what's happening in ISIS and Iraq is, really has nothing to do with this. Everybody knows it. No. Nobody knows. A lot of people don't know. In fact, 42% of Americans believe that an average Muslim is sympathetic with the terrorist groups. So it is my role. It is my duty to let them know that this does not represent the religion of Islam. It does not represent the Muslim community. And therefore, I would like to finish my talk. How many minutes do I have? 30? Thank you. <laughs> I would like to conclude with the following three points. We cannot bring those changes to our community unless we keep in mind the following three. Number one, education. What do I mean by education? I mean education for the entire Muslim community, whether it's the community that lives in America or lives in the Middle East. You see the reason sometimes some people ask me, why do you have so many terrorists in Muslim countries? I say, because we lack schools. I've been to many of them, if not every single one of them. And I went to one of them and there was a, an extremely important person in the government who sat with me and he said, you know how we define literacy in our country? If you can write your name. Yet, 32% of the people are illiterate. And there is terrorism in that country. Why? Because this person wakes up every morning and feels, I really don't belong here. Intellectually, he does not belong anywhere because he wakes up every morning, people are going to work, making good ends meet, being able to pay rent, being able to drive a car, being able to send their kids to school, being able to buy them clothes. And this guy does not have that ability because he does not have any formal education. So he suffers every day of his life, as every day of his life is a suffering. And he's illiterate from some remote village. So they tell him, listen, here's $50,000 for your family, go buy them a home. And in return, you can go and have breakfast with a prophet and end your miseries. Why wouldn't he? This person is simple. He does not know 
anything more than maybe a four or five year old child growing up in New York. And therefore, that's why we have terrorism. We don't need any more mosques in the Middle East. We need schools. We need universities. And we also, in, in Northern America, we need to educate ourselves. Don't tell me it's important for me to go and pray for 30 days and recite the whole Quran every single day. But they come and they ask me, listen, this verse, there's a pastor, his name is Terry Jones. He says, you Muslims are supposed to kill non-Muslims. And this is it, it's in the Quran. How do you respond to this? So I tell them, listen, I've been praying for 20 years, 30 years, reciting the Quran. But I don't know how to explain this verse to you. That's a shame. That's a shame. Allah sent us the Qur'an so we understand the Qur'an. We don't become tape players. We're not an MP3 player that just reads, reads, reads the Qur'an. We're supposed to understand why was this verse revealed? When was it revealed? What is the purpose of this verse? So we need to educate ourselves. Let's not create mosques and do what we used to do back home because that has not been working for us here. We need to educate our youth. When our youth come to this community and they leave and they go and they're asked by an employer, by a friend, by an employee at work about a verse in the Quran, they're supposed to be, they are meant to be able to give them a sufficient answer. So number one is education. Number two is that we need to act like the Prophet Muhammad as well. And by that I mean we need to condemn those who do not act like the Prophet Muhammad, but yet they carry his name. People that are killing innocent people, barbaric animals, they're not even human beings. And they're all over the media. What have I done personally to encounter that? Have I been nicer than I used? I should be. It's my responsibility. When I have a non-Muslim neighbor, and my neighbor, the, he won't come and tell me, listen, I'm nervous that you're my neighbor, honestly. He won't do that. But numbers and polls tell us that he is not as comfortable as if, if he had a, a different neighbor that was not Muslim. So what do I do? I have to go the extra mile. And that's in the Quran. Be kind to your neighbor that is near and be kind to your neighbor that is far. And every scholar of the Quran says near in faith and far from your faith. So if he's, a, for example, an atheist, he doesn't believe in God. He's the neighbor that is far. The neighbor that is near is the neighbor that believes in God. Be kind to them, both of them. If he needs to get things done when he's traveling, catch his mail. Clean his house, look after his pet. Go the extra mile. That's when you start acting like the Prophet Muhammad. That's when you will be representing the Prophet Muhammad And that is why I emphasize on the issue of neighbors. Be kind to your neighbors. Do not disturb your neighbors. Be the best of neighbors, whether it's neighbors at work or neighbors within your residence that live right next to you. And number three, the right representation and leadership. And with this I conclude. And many of us Muslims, we sometimes lack fair leadership. Meaning people represent different minorities in the West, but when it comes to representing the religion of Islam, they're shaky. Representing Muslims, they're shaky. Engaging with the Muslim community, not so much. So we need to engage with our leadership, with our representation and our local governments so that they represent us equally. And this country, Canada, has embraced you. And you have to embrace Canada. You have to be patriotic. You have to love your land, defend your land. Those who are born and raised in this country your responsibility is no longer to defend any country in the Middle East. It is your responsibility to defend this land. And this land is not at war, so you don't have to go and join the army. Defending this land means that you stick to its laws, you become a good citizen, and you have the best of input in this society. 
You become the best of educators, the best of lawmakers, and you become part of the society. A country that is based on religious equality and freedom and has proved that for many years now. You've come to this country and it's welcomed you while you ran away for a better life from your own. True? I remember several years ago, well not several years, many years ago when we got to LAX, my family, 16 men from my family were killed in Iraq by Saddam. So when we reached LAX, the immigration officer stamped our passport saying, welcome home. This is your home. And we have to be able to understand that. And we have to be able to communicate that as well. So the month of Ramadan is the month of change, the month where we begin the change within ourselves. And we take that change outside the borders of our family, within our community, and we hope for a better Ramadan and a better year and the following year, inshallah. God bless you all. Wassalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh.